If this is what the average American marriage looks like, your country is in deeper shit than I thought it was. Hi guys, it's Suri, so welcome back to my channel. Today's video is very unexpected to me because honestly, I was not prepared to feel this strongly about this certain book. Um, but I finished it today and I honestly just felt this strong urge to sit down and talk about it because I think that there's so many issues here that no one else has really ever touched upon before. I was trying to find some reviews in Goodreads and most people love this book a lot. I think it even won a Goodreads Choice Award last year. So I feel like there's a lot to unpack here and we need to do that right now. Before we get started though, please don't forget to like this video if you're enjoying my content and subscribe. I upload three times a week, so you don't want to miss out on that. But now without further ado, let's just do this, I guess. You can probably tell by the title, but the book I'm talking about today is An American Marriage by T.R. Jones. This is a contemporary fiction novel. It came out last year and it follows a young married black couple. They are newlyweds and one night they spend at a hotel where another woman in that hotel is raped and the man of the couple is wrongfully convicted of this crime and put away to prison for 12 years. This obviously causes a lot of troubles in their marriage and the wife turns to her old friend, uh, her basically like best friends since they were very little for comfort and this just adds to more drama <laughs> you could say and uh, overall it's just a very character focused book very much focused on their relationship between these three people because also the man Roy is uh, actually a friend of his now rival it's a love triangle essentially in a very complicated way and I started off quite enjoying this book. It's definitely very slow because it is so character focused and it definitely doesn't have a lot of plot. Like everything I just told you is the entire book. There's no plot twists really. There's nothing like, oh my God, didn't see that coming. There's no real developments. It's kind of just like these people and their relationship to one another. And they can get tedious at times. As I was reading, I felt like, okay, I don't feel too strongly about the characters, but that's fine. It doesn't have much of a plot, but that's fine. So it's going to be somewhere around the three to four star area because it's still well written. It's a quite a nice insight into these people's lives. Like I don't have any major issues with it. And then the ending happened, like the last 150 to 100 pages happened and I just lost it. I was sitting yelling at this book. I was so close to just throwing it across the room because it made me so incredibly mad. The normalization of such an unhealthy relationship. <sighs> but let me back up a little bit. So my issues with their relationship kind of started very early on into the book. So the young couple is introduced as having only been married for a year. We don't really know how long they've been together before that, but it doesn't seem to have been too long of a time. But where Roy lost me was only about 10 pages into the book when he literally says, and I'm gonna read this to you because I was like, what? So basically, just before this, Celestial found his business card in his pocket with another woman's like room number and phone number uh, written on it. And he says, I can explain this. And then he like kind of narrates. The truth was straightforward. I like the ladies. I enjoyed the, a little flirtation, what they call frisson. Sometimes I collected phone numbers like I was still in college but 99.997% of the time it ended there. i just like to know that I still had it. Harmless, right? That is not harmless. They, those 0.003% are too much. Let's just be straight here, okay? <laughs> it's not about like the degree to which you're unfaithful. It's the fact that you're unfaithful, like that's enough. It's like, well, I am flirting like, a hundred times and only one of those times 
or actually less, like, I don't know, math, but let's say only one of those times something more happens, like I kiss her or whatever, like we don't even know what he does, but he just is so blasé about it. It's like, whatever, I'm so good, like 99.987% of the time. It's like he's talking about a diet. You know how people say like, I am like 99.99% of the time, I can resist that piece of chocolate cake, but sometimes, you know, it's whatever. Like in terms of a diet, it truly is whatever, but that's not how faithfulness works. That's not how monogamy or marriage works. If that monogamy is not your thing, then don't get married. I feel like it's that simple, isn't it? I wanna preface this by saying that I am gonna like spoil this book. There's nothing to spoil, I think. So if you still wanna read this for the writing, the characters, for whatever reason, you can. Like, I don't think it's gonna be much of an issue that I like ex tell you some plot points because it's not really that, right? Like, it's just like, oh, we just learn more about you, but it's not a revelation, really. He then basically proceeds to tell her a secret that he has somehow kept from her for their entire relationship, which is that his father isn't actually his biological father. And, you know, understandably, Celestial is like upset by that. But he's, he explains it away by like, well, I didn't want you thinking differently of like my mother because she had me out of wedlock or whatever. At the time I read this, I was annoyed at him, but I didn't see the full picture yet. But it does indicate a pattern of him sort of explaining away his mistakes. And he's always making excuses for things he does wrong, essentially somehow finding a way to blame Celestial because of some made up reason that he has projected on her. It's just like in this case where he assumes that she or her parents would feel differently about his mother. But that is such a breach of trust in my opinion. Like how can you marry somebody and just keep something like that from them? It's not like it changes anything, but the fact that you lied about it, that changes everything. This is also just the start of a pattern of both of these people just keeping things from each other. Celestial also reveals something like new um, about her life towards the end of the book. And I am just baffled <laughs> at how these two people ever even got together. They have no chemistry, they have nothing in common, and basically their entire relationship start to finish is incredibly unhealthy from both sides. But anyway, let's keep going. So basically, Roy gets put into prison and at first they start writing letters back and forth. And I really enjoyed that part because it showed very vividly how, how their relationship deteriorated and kind of changed over the course of these letters because it was in epistolary format. It there, there were lots of misunderstandings that could have possibly been avoided otherwise or they were like stepping on each other's toes that weren't like phrasing things the right way and making each other angry and I felt like that was the best part of the book because that was to me the most realistic. Just imagine yourself in such a horrible situation regardless of whether you're the husband of the, or the wife in this scenario. And so that was the moment where I couldn't, felt like I could connect to them the most. Unfortunately, that didn't last too long because by the end of their like letter exchange, five years have passed and Roy has been released because his conviction has been overturned, but he and Celestial have actually not been in contact for the past three years, I believe. So after two years of his stint in prison, their relationship deteriorated to the point where neither of them, or like Celestial at least, said like, I can't go on anymore. She essentially offered to still help him, still be his friend, and he said, no, I don't want that, just leave me alone. And I totally understand both of those positions, as I said, especially since their relationship was so rocky from the start, I totally get why she was not prepared to wait for him for 12 whole years. But in those last two or three years, um, Celestial has in fact taken up with Andre, her um, f lifelong friend and also Roy's friend from college and the two have started something of a relationship so she Celestial hasn't actually fully divorced Roy which I also at that time just did not understand. Somehow she just wasn't able to fully let him go so she stayed married to him but 
I guess moved in with this other guy who has basically had a crush on her his entire life and uh, she uses him for comfort essentially because she feels lonely with her husband in prison and when he gets out this whole thing obviously blows up in everybody's faces Roy gets very mad at both Celestial and Andre even though this is what he's been speculating all along like he was under no delusions really he was always thinking like I, I'm pretty sure they're like they've started something together but when he confronts them in person that's where things turn from unpleasant or like understandable reactions to situations that you didn't want to be in and that were forced upon you and that you kind of had to work your way around to a complete and utter shit show and this is also the point of the book where um, all of these tabs come in because I like literally every page to every other page these people would do and say things and especially Roy that were that were so icky that were so terrible and nobody really called them out for it so I'm gonna read some of these to you um, at this point in the book Roy has told Andre to pick him up in Louisiana, I believe. So Andre has gone there to pick him up, but Roy has actually been released earlier and has already made his way to Atlanta to Celestial, his wife, um, because he wanted to kind of not talk to Andre and rather talk to his wife, which I personally think is totally understandable. Of course, you would wanna like sort this out with your wife. You know you've been away for five years, you haven't talked for several years. There's obviously something wrong with your relationship, but you're still kind of married. You don't know where you're staying with each other. You wanna go and talk to her. However, when he gets to Celestial's place, even though he says, let's talk about a million times, they don't talk at all they do not discuss a single one of their issues they do not talk about anything anytime roy asks her to like explain herself like what do you want from the future i know what happened i forgive you for what you did but let me know what you want and she just does not reply let's just say that's the first strike at that point in the book where i was like that is a very shitty reaction you're a husband whom you have not yet divorced for whatever reason has just returned from prison the least you can do is explain yourself or at least say like i this is what i want this is where i'm at but no she just basically ignores him she doesn't ignore him but she doesn't reply anything meaningful she doesn't give him anything in Roy's place, I honestly don't know what I would do. I probably would just be like, look, this is where I am at and I just explain my side. What he instead does is essentially emotionally blackmail her into almost having sex with him. And this is truly the most disgusting scene in the entire book because it is written from her perspective and the entire time she's like, he poor him he just got out of prison i really hurt him this is the least i can do and it's this entire inner monologue of like her justifying not reacting to the situation and somehow you know making it seem okay that he is essentially sexually assaulting her because while they're sitting there not actually talking to each other he is already like feeling her up like literally the first thing he pretty much does when he gets there even fully knowing their situation how complicated it is he kisses her that's the first thing he does and she doesn't fully engage with the kiss either she clearly wasn't on page with that but that's what he does because that's what he needed in that moment and he says this a lot <sighs> and it makes me so mad it makes me so mad look I'm not trying to say that I understand what it's like to be in prison let alone be there convicted for a crime that you didn't actually commit I'm not trying to claim that I know what that is like but this I can say under absolutely no circumstances does anybody owe you sex this is this is the bottom line right no matter what you went through i do not care and just because that woman is the legally a wife does not mean you deserve to have sex with her 
That's not how that works. That's not how consent works. And neither of them seem to understand this. So I'm going to read you a few things that truly made me gag and almost throw up on my bed as I was reading this. So this is at the beginning of that scene, sort of. It goes on for way too long. But basically, he is currently touching her face in the dark. And she's not really doing anything. She's just letting him do everything. And that's kind of the gist. That's kind of the theme for this entire scene. And then this is what's going on through her mind. A woman doesn't always have a choice. Not in a meaningful way. Sometimes there's a debt that must be paid, a comfort that she's obliged to provide, a safe passage that must be secured. Every one of us has lain down for a reason that was not love. I'm questioning that. I'm questioning that hard. Could I deny Roy, my husband, when he returned home from a bachelor older than his father and his father's father? The answer is that I could not. Behind Roy in the narrow hallway, I understood that Andre had known this from the start. This is why he raced down the highway to keep me from doing this thing that we all feared I would have to do. And then she says, like, how then should I classify what transpired between my husband and me the night he returned to me from prison? I'm going to call it sexual assault. That could have very well ended in rape, but you do you. Roy snaked his hands under my blouse and he says, you love me, you know you do. I wouldn't have answered even if he hadn't cut off my breath with a kiss that tasted like desire streaked through with anger. Yes means yes and no means no. But what is the meaning of silence? And when I read this, I was truly astonished and horrified that this, this, this is literally coming from the person this is happening to. And she is just justifying it, explaining it away, normalizing it. And it made me so angry. No matter what, I'm going to say it again. No matter what, you do not Oh, anybody, sex. You do not. This is your body. This is your life. You are in charge here. You can make these decisions. And he is just as wrong in this situation, touching her without her permission, keeping on doing it, even though he's realizing and noticing that she's not responding, that she's not actively participating. Why is he so persistent? This is... This is truly horrifying. She then asks him if he has um, protection. Now, as far as I could tell from the book, this was their preferred method of birth control, even when they were married. And he reacts in the most obnoxious way. I mean, that's what we're used to from him by now, I guess. But still, he basically gets really upset that she would dare to ask him if he can use a condom. She's already not super comfortable having sex in the first place and he has been away for several years and she probably doesn't want to be pregnant from the guy that she's not even sure like what their relationship is at. He gets so mad. He's saying things like, you, you think I'm like dirty now because I was in prison, like I have some disease or something like that. Or what is it? Do you still not want my child? I'm like, of course not. Why would anybody? <laughs> At this point, why would anybody? As they lie there in bed and fighting over if he should be made to use protection or not, he actually starts to guilt trip her and like starts to tell her things of like horrible stuff that happened to him in prison. Like not actually, we don't actually ever find out most of the things that happened to him, which I also found very annoying because it made it difficult to relate to that. Like, I don't know what did he experience. I can't, you know, connect his actions to his the experiences he had when I don't know the experiences. But he basically says like, you don't know what I've been through. Don't treat me like a criminal. Why are you doing? Why are you being like this? Like, oh, Jesus Christ, I've never been so mad at a book in my life. This goes on and on and on. And from that point forward, the book doesn't get better in that regard at all. And he eventually tells her he is in pain and he needs sex, apparently. And he even goes so far as to say, you know, I could take it if I wanted to. I could, I could, but I won't. And again, 
we are at a point where Roy is literally clapping himself on the back for doing the bare minimum. And I mean bare minimum, not raping your estranged wife after five years in prison when she clearly doesn't want to, is possibly in love with somebody else, is literally the bare minimum. Congratulations. You've reached the bottom of the barrel. I don't know where you were, that that is your highest point so far, but wow, wow. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm getting so worked up. This is making me so mad. I'm just imagining people coming kind of emotional. People actually being in this position, getting so angry. <laughs> okay. Then we are at the chapter break and the next chapter is from Roy's perspective. And right at the beginning, he recounts the moment right after he got out of prison where he basically shacked up immediately with uh, a random girl he knew in high school and he sleeps with her and he literally says that she somehow healed him with her vagina not literally but that's pretty much like he says that something along the lines of like a man needs to be inside a woman and it heals him or some shit like that no joke. This is, I'm not kidding. This is written black on white in this book. Just so you know. Basically, he just like remembers uh, that time and like he told her after he spent a few days with her that he was gonna see if his marriage was still a thing and that, and she's um, obviously upset by that and she tells him not to contact her again because she doesn't want to deal with his shit. Totally on her side on, on that as well. This next morning, basically, he calls her and he and she asks him if what they had was like something or nothing and he says it was something but he's still like trying to figure out what um his marriage thing is this is going to be relevant later on so i just want to mention it here so while this is happening andre um has reached louisiana and he's at um, roy's father's house who is also called roy and uh basically his father is stalling andre so he doesn't get back too soon to give like roy and celestial time to talk which we now know they're not actually doing and Roy's father as he's trying to keep Andre from going back to Atlanta is basically trying to convince him that Roy needs Celestial more than Andre does and that Andre should just like step back let Roy have her as if she were a piece of property and the way to talk about her from that point forward really is very territorial and very obnoxious and like like this is a choice that the men make right like this is their choice who she chooses it just whoever is left after they you know decided between the two of them right so Roy's father says to Andre you want her but you don't need her you see what I'm saying little Roy needs his woman she is the only thing he has left of the life he had before the life he worked for and then Andre says that he does need her after all, that she makes him happy and stuff like that. So Andre in all this mess is the least horrible character. He at least, as far as I could tell from the few chapters from his perspective, did not see Celestial as like his possession like Roy does and did. And he is a little bit more understanding of the complexity and the difficulty of the situation for all sides so he is my favorite character as far as that's possible in a book with extremely horrible people so the next morning roy and celestial are kind of weird with each other and um, any little thing she does is giving roy some sort of hope somehow he even said before this like the fact that she didn't divorce him that she didn't change the keys that she kept giving him money while he was in prison all these things somehow led him to believe that they were still good in their relationship which to me is so weird because those are again just like the bare minimum kind things that you would do to somebody except maybe for the divorce thing like i don't understand that but other than that like not changing the keys that would be kind of mean if she did do that. So I don't get why he feels encouraged by all of these tiny little things. He reminisces about the fact that it seems like Celestial doesn't want to be with him anymore. And he says, or he narrates in his head, she had made her choice. I could see it in the determined square of her shoulder as she washed my plate and cup. 
She had chosen what it was going to be and that was that. Just like a jury in a prefab courtroom had decided that I was a rapist and that was that. Just like a jury in another shabby courtroom decided I was going to prison and that was that. No, those are not comparable at all. Celestial is deciding over her own life. She's evaluating, hopefully we would wish, her feelings and based on those feelings and other factors, she's gonna make her decision and it is her decision. That's just how it works. I'm sorry. That's just how relationships work. If one of two people doesn't wanna be in it, then unfortunately that is that. And it's not the same as being judged for a crime you didn't commit because there are in fact things that you did wrong to lead to you not being allowed in this relationship anymore. Very, very different. And then he goes on to be a complete dick. What could I tell Celestial? Could I demand that she love me again? Last night when we were in bed, when she was chanting protection, protection for a moment, less than a moment, a micro moment, a nano moment, I thought about showing her that it wasn't up to her. Five years ago, I swore to a jury that I had never violated any woman. Even in college, I never wrestled with a date until things went my way. Again, barest of minimums, barest. Also, this sentence is the most sugar-coated like euphemism for sexual assault I have ever read. Wrestled with a date until things went my way. Call it what it is. And also again, don't pat yourself on the back for being a decent person. He then goes into the garage and goes through some of his old stuff that she had like packed up. Um, and as he does that, he kind of flies into a rage and starts hitting her car with a tennis racket. This is no joke. He like actually does it. He's like the first blow was like an accident. And then like, he just like gets overwhelmed by rage and he just hits the car a lot. And literally she comes into the garage and says this, honey, what are you doing? She used the little remote to silence the alarm. You okay? The pity in her voice scraped over my skin. Who reacts to your husband, semi-husband, hitting your car with a tennis racket this way? What in what universe is this an appropriate reaction? So he keeps going and eventually she says, Roy, stop it, she said, sighing like an exhausted mother, set down the tennis racket. I'm not your child, I said. I'm a grown man. Why can't you talk to me like I'm a man? Because you behave like a child. That is literally the most childish reaction I have ever heard about. Hitting somebody's car because they don't love you? Like what, in what universe is this an appropriate mature adult decision that you made? Don't expect people to treat you like an adult when you don't behave like one. And unfortunately, things get much worse. He then picks up like an axe and Celestial is obviously scared and he can see it in her face and he gets upset as fuck that she dares be scared of him when he just tried to trash her car and is literally holding an axe. He's like, you think I'm dangerous now? Do you know me at all? I don't know. I don't know. Is this your normal? Like what? is going on with these people what is going on so then he's still holding the axe in his hand and she says andre is going to be home soon and he says stop talking about him i want to know if you love me any normal human based on just like how she had been behaving would have probably realized that she clearly doesn't but um not roy and when he says i need to know if you love me i'm pretty sure he means i need you to say that you love me because otherwise i don't know what i'm gonna do but then she says Andre again, and then he goes, oh no, he like thinks, she said his name one too many times. For what happened next, she would have to take some of the blame. I asked her a simple question and she refused to give me a simple answer. And then he proceeds to like run across the yard with the ax and like hack down an ancient tree that her family really loved and that like had been standing there for absolutely ever and he just destroys it and blames her for it because logic and then andre arrives back and the two of them start 
a thing. And this is the yuckiest point of the book because, well, no, the other parts were yuckier, but this is one of the most infuriating points because they are literally fighting over Celestial again as if she were a thing, as if it were up to them to decide who she ends up with. Even though Roy has been at this house for several hours and all night and had ample opportunity to actually talk to Celestial and deal with things in a communicative, adult, healthy way, instead he sexually assaulted her and didn't start a meaningful conversation with her in that time, destroyed her car, destroyed her tree. But when Andre comes, he's very much like, we need to talk about this. Come on, let's talk about this. This is the first thing he says to Andre pretty much like, come on, we need to we need to do this between us. It's between us. And Celestial, he even tells her to go, to go into the house because it's between them. And she's like, no, I want to be here for this. And they're like, nope, this is, you know how things get between men. This is between us. <laughs> so Roy asks him, what was it that made you say, fuck old Roy? I'm sorry he's sitting in prison, but I think I'll help myself to his woman again because that's how it works apparently, because we're in the year 1885. He proceeds to repeatedly ask Andre why he stole his wife and gets very aggressive and like, Andre is kind of trying to say that he didn't steal her, but he never really says like, this is not my choice, this is all, not just my choice, this is also her choice. This is like a mutual thing, it's, it's, this doesn't work like that. It's not like, you know, you left a chocolate bar in the fridge and like your roommate ate it and then you're like why did you steal my chocolate bar i don't know why i'm all having all these chocolate allegories today but you know what i mean like that's not the same thing <laughs> this is a woman this is a person this is a human being you can't steal a human being you know that's just not how that works and obviously to no one's surprise they get into a fight they start kicking each other so that's at this point is in the house because she has somehow given in, like left the scene. I don't know what, she, she knew what they were gonna do, but like when they do start fighting, she goes back out and um, kind of stops them, threatens to call the police. And Roy's like, do it, do it, just whatever, like all in his martyr state, like, oh my God, poor me, everybody's against me. Of course she's gonna call the police and put me back into prison. And then they, she doesn't, they kind of, everybody steps, takes a step back. And then Roy's like, I didn't kick him. When he was on the ground, I didn't kick him. I could have, but I didn't. Again, barest of minimums. You still hit the shit out of him. Like, this is, this is, I'm not even, I don't even know how these people can rationalize these things. At this point, in Celestial's shoes, I probably would have kicked them both out. At the very least, I would have kicked Roy out. I would tell him to fuck himself, like, this is over, you're an idiot, you like come to my house, you start shit with my boyfriend, you are physically and mentally and emotionally abusive, you are threatening violence, you are actively violent and uh, destroying my property, like the list is endless, but no. She sends Andre home to his house and uh, takes Roy inside and she's like all worried about him, like, are you okay? Like trying to be like helpful somehow. I don't understand. I just do not understand like what is going on in this woman's mind. Like I get that he was in prison, but again, not an excuse to be a complete asshole and not only an asshole in like, oh, he's kind of shitty. Like he's actively dangerous at this point. And still it's just excused as like, oh, well, he was in prison. Poor him. He suffered at the hand of the state because he's a black man. Like I'm sure that is true. I'm sure he was probably put into prison in part because of his race. I don't know the details. They're not really explained in the book. I'm just assuming. But th none of that, none of that justifies any of what's going on here. It just doesn't. So as she is basically helping him inside the house and trying to nurse his wounds, like, I don't know why, like she sent Andre home. I'm sure he's also hurt, but you know, of course, Roy, much more important. So as she's leading him back into the house, she's asking him like, tell me the truth. Would you have waited for me for five years? And he goes like, this would never have happened to you, Celestial. Like all patronizing, all hypocritical, because let's remember those 0.003% that were probably not even like meaningful things that were just like hookups in random places. 
how is that not not it's not the same thing but how isn't that equally as bad infidelity is infidelity to me there's no like grading system there's no like oh it was just like five percent unfaithful like it's the same it's all the same you have no moral high ground to stand on in the night Celestial goes over to Andre and basically tells him that she's gonna go back together with Roy. Now at this point, I lost my shit because, I mean, I have been seeing it coming because Celestial is just as stupid as Roy. She just makes so many stupid decisions. And clearly they both think that he is entitled to something from her because he spent five years in prison wrongfully. I don't know why they came to that absurd conclusion, but I'm sure in their brains that somehow makes sense. So now we're in a situation where basically a day before, Celestial had been very distant, very withdrawn, non-participative in his advances on her. She barely talked to him, she did not reciprocate his physical advances. That was her a day ago. In the meantime, all that has happened is that he has destroyed her car, he has destroyed her tree, and he has picked a fight with her boyfriend. In her brain, those things equal to, oh, now our relationship is back to normal because that is how she acts the next day. She's all lovey-dovey. She like calls him baby and smiles at him and is very ready to give this thing another shot for, again, what earthly reason? I do not know. Roy then calls his previous um, like fling or semi something, I don't know, the, the lady who healed him with her vagina. Uh, he calls her again and they have another little conversation. Actually, I think that's the point where she's, they, she asks her if um, it's a something or a nothing and um, he says it's something. And then Roy immediately after tells Celestial about this phone call. Strange as this may seem, my confession felt familiar, like a favorite pair of jeans. The dynamic was a holdover from before when we quarreled as only lovers do. Again, normalizing cheating, normalizing a, a relationship where this is a daily thing, where this is just a part of it where this is just something to be accepted. It's just part of our relationship. We're just so passionate. We like love each other one second, and hate each other the next. This is what defines us. This is what, what the good part. This was the good part. This was the good beginning. I'm getting nostalgic about the beginning of our relationship because this is the same dynamic. Me being unfaithful and her getting kind of upset about it. He says, I called her a second ago while you were in the shower. I slowed my delivery, letting each word land hard. I didn't enjoy unspooling the details. Sure about that? I swear I didn't want to hurt Celestial, but I did need to know if I could. If I, I had to know if I still had that kind of power, that kind of sway. This does not scream the most manipulative, emotionally abusive asshole to you. This is exactly what I mean when I say that this is a very, very unhealthy relationship. Roy is very abusive and she just rolls with the punches. When they lie in bed that night, she wants to have sex with him for some reason. And she keeps asking him, please Roy, let me make this right. This is how I love you. So by that point, she has actually somehow internalized this idea that she owes Roy something. I mean, this has been a part of how her thinking for a long time, but now she's reached a point where she's like, yes, you're right. What I owe you, what you need from me right now is sex. I don't want to, but that's beside the point. You need it. I'm here for you when you need me. So this is what we do. No matter what you did, this is what we do. So they start to have sex and Celestial is clearly not into it, but she's kind of doing him it for him. And then he says to her, Celestial, I will never force myself upon a woman. And he kind of rejects her advances and he says, do you hear me? I will not force you. Even if you'll let me, even if you want me to, I will not do it. So again, he wants us to, and her to be like, good job, you. You've realized finally that she's not actually into this, but it's taken you a very long time because only now that she's actually ready to do it, you just wanted to know if she was capable of doing this. You just wanted to know if she would go as far as to give you sex, even though she didn't want it. But now that you have this assurance and you know that you still have her in the palm of your hand and you can decide what she does and, and this is all up to you, now you're 
finding it in yourself to be gracious and be like, no, it's fine. Just, just go. It's okay. It's fine. I forgive you. It's okay. And they split up. What? Really? And then the epilogue is them writing letters back and forth. And she's with Andre. He's with this lady that he slept with twice. Uh, and it's a happily ever after, I guess. I don't know. What the fuck did I just read? I know this video is very long. I did not expect to talk about this so much, but this has really, really struck me because it makes me so mad. It makes me so sad for people who are in relationships like this. And it makes me just sad for anybody who thinks that this is normal, who thinks that this is okay, that this is justified, that any of this is justified. See, I don't know if the author believes that this is a normal, healthy relationship. I don't know if the readers that read this think that this is a healthy relationship. But I will say that it certainly is a possibility because it does come across like this is just how it is. None of the characters ever call this dynamic into question. No one goes and says, this is an unhealthy relationship. The only small voice of reason sometimes is Andre, and he doesn't really comment on their dynamic. He only says sometimes like, oh, she's not territory. She's not something to be possessed. But that's about it. That's where his input ends. Other than that, nobody challenges this dynamic nobody calls it unhealthy nobody calls it like fucked up and horrible nobody calls roy out for what he did he is suffering zero consequences he she didn't even break up with him he broke up with her basically even though she wanted to but he ended it it was all in his hands he was the decision maker along the road he was in charge the entire way through and she just went along with it. I also have my bone to pick with her and her weak character, how she's incapable of making decisions, like figuring out what she wants and sticking up for it. Because if she wanted Andre, she could have had him earlier because she's known him all her life. Also, she could have just like committed to him as she actually told him, which I didn't tell you, but uh, they were engaged when Roy got back. She said, yes, I'm gonna marry you, Andre. Granted, she also wasn't super hyped about this engagement, which is another red flag to me, was like, just say what you want. If you don't wanna marry him, say no. But she just went along with what the men in her life decided for her, essentially. So first, she was with Roy because Roy wanted her, then Roy went to prison, and Andre wanted her, and she couldn't have Roy. So she went along with that and then Roy came back and wanted her again. So she was like, okay. And then Roy didn't want her again. And she was like, okay, Andre, I'll take you again. Like, what the fuck are you doing? As much as Roy's actions are just atrocious and ter terrible and truly the worst of the worst. If you had taken him up on his offer to talk in the first place and just been upfront with what you want, things might have gone differently. I don't know. I can't say. I'm not putting it past him to just have raped her at that moment. But at the same time, I don't know. Because maybe if you were just clear about what you wanted, he wouldn't have gotten his hopes up. And the same goes for Andre. If you had told him, no, I still have feelings for my husband, I don't want to marry you, or I don't want to get married at all, but we can be together. Like all of these are viable options. You just have to choose something or this will happen where other people choose something for you and you're just gonna have to be like, well, now I'm gonna have to just go with the flow, I guess. The bottom line is that I think regardless of whether this was intended by the author as showcasing a normal relationship or a unhealthy relationship, whether this was supposed to be a warning sign or just a everyday occurrence story, I do not care because I'm sure people are gonna comment like, I'm sure she wanted this to be like an unhealthy relationship, showcasing what prison does to people. Sure, there's gonna be a comment like that. I just wanna preemptively reply to that and say, no, no excuses. No excuses for Roy's behavior, even though he was in prison. I don't believe that. You're still responsible for how you act. You're still 
in charge of your life and of your decisions. I do pity you for having had your life upended, but that does not mean that other people you know, owe you something now. And on the note of what the author intended, I don't know. I'm not sitting here trying to tell you that she thinks that this is a healthy relationship and she's trying to get people to have this kind of relationship. But what I will say is that this book makes no effort to call this type of behavior out. It makes no effort to warn people away from this. So I don't know what to think about this book but it definitely made me very upset. I think it's very troubling to me that this is out there. The people maybe that won't question it as much are gonna just assume that this is normal, especially if they recognize this kind of behavior in their own lives. I am worried that they might feel validated in their experiences and feel like, oh, well, it happens to other people too, so it's fine. This is not okay. I just wanna put that out there. This type of behavior is not okay. And I think this book should have made it clearer that it isn't. And it could have done so, as I said, by having it called out by the characters or at the very least having had negative consequences for the people perpetrating these horrible things, i.e. Roy. Just my two cents though. Or I guess just my like enormously long rant review. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. I hope you found it interesting. I would love to know what you think about this, especially if you've read this book. If you agree that this book is kind of normalizing unhealthy, abusive relationships, or if you think that it's more subtle than that and kind of like subliminally trying to turn you away from that and like call it out for what it is. I would love to know your thoughts in any case. Please leave them in the comments down below and don't forget to like and subscribe, upload every Tuesday, Friday and Sunday and I will see you very soon with another video. Until then, have a lovely week. Bye!